Good morning, everyone. I've got, uh, um, so today I wanna to share some, some work in progress. Uh, basically, I wanna bounce some ideas off you. So at any point, feel free to interrupt, ask questions. Um, like I said, this is work in progress talk. Uh, I haven't had a lot of success at the hallway track and conferences this year. So this is, I'm sort of using this as an opportunity to bounce ideas off of you that I've been, I've been thinking about alone in my lab. And uh, I, I've only gotten a little bit of uh, time at conferences and workshops to talk about them. So um, some, of, some of what I'm gonna say in this talk I know is wrong. I know there's at least one counterexample to a conjecture in here. Uh, and, but I think it's promising work and I, I think it's thought provoking. So I hope you'll, you'll enjoy the talk. Okay, um, let's just, let me start with uh, giving a spoiler for my entire talk. So what I've been thinking lately, my thesis is that the key, the key problem in compiler correctness is modeling language interoperability. If you have a good model of interoperability between your, your source and target language, between the languages you want to link and compile, uh, you can pretty much prove compiler correctness. If you ignore all of that, proving whole program compiler correctness is, is next to trivial. The real problem is linking and defining what it means for uh, two languages to interoperate. So my idea is that if we start from a good interoperability semantics, we can pretty easily derive a correct compiler. And that's what I really wanna be able to show. And in this talk, I'm gonna show one way to do that. And basically what we're going to do is model interoperability as a multi-language operational semantics as a giant rewrite system. Uh, and if that is confluent, we should be able to derive a correct compiler from normalization of that rewrite system from that multi-language semantics. Okay. So that's my whole talk in one slide. Now, obviously to explain this, we need to talk about what is a model of a compiler, when is it correct, and why interoperability is the key problem here. Uh, it looks like Sam has a question. Yeah, sorry for asking a question right off the bat, but um, no, no, no. so you, you seem to be ruling out um, non-determinism with data races by insisting on confluence. Is yeah, yeah. Um, I have not considered non, well, okay. So the whole the whole rewrite system is non-deterministic, but still confluent. So yeah, I'm not considering data races. I'm not considering parallelism right now. So, right, and it's not gonna, yeah, not gonna work for a distributed system, for instance. Yeah, probably not. I, I don't see how this particular model would capture that, um, but I haven't tried to think about it yet. So okay. that's, that's a good point. There, there is at least that limitation in this, this model. By the way, Ohad, I think there's somebody still in the waiting room and I can't click admit. Okay, any other questions? Okay, great. So let's start with compiler correctness 101. How do you prove a compiler correct? So uh, here I'm using two different colors to represent my source and target language. And compiler correctness in its uh, simplest form is basically if we have some source term E that runs to a value in the source language, then we can translate E into the target language into some M in the target language. And it should be the case that M runs to some target value U and the original value in the source language V should compile to this, to this target value U, right? Or more generally, maybe there's some relation between values across languages, okay? So this is the simplest form of compiler correctness. And there's a few tweaks you could do. Maybe you guarantee that any valid term actually compiles. Um, that's a little bit irrelevant. And the key, the key here is that we're defining correctness in terms of running programs, right? So we need a whole program in order for this compiler correctness theorem to make any sense. We need to be able to run programs. So it doesn't capture linking, which is a pretty common thing we all do when we write programs. So we could generalize this theorem. Um, oh, I had some slides on this. All right, so defines everything in terms of evaluation. We want to generalize this to talk about linking, right? Probably all of you have linked a program with some other library uh, before or after running it. So the next theorem that we might prove is uh, correctness of separate compilation. So what this says is if we have two source modules, E and E prime, and we link them together in the source language, and then they run to a value V, we can separately compile E and E prime to some M and some M prime, and then link in the target language and then run to some U. And it should be the case that U and uh, V are related across languages, right? So this is a stronger theorem. Now we have uh, the ability to link programs and we can separately compile modules. Uh, this is probably a good model if you wanted to prove say like the Haskell compiler correct, you would want at least this. The, the limitation is though that we can only link with components. We only get guarantees if we link with components uh, in the same language that were compiled with the same compiler. So baked into this theorem, we're talking about the compiler, right? We're saying E compiles to M, 
And to do that, we're referring to which compiler compiles E and which compiler compiles E prime. So we only get guarantees when we have uh, the same compiler compiling both modules. And we have to have a source language component, right? We, in order to refer to this theorem, both E and E prime need to exist in the source language. So we don't have any way to talk about linking with a binary only library or some handwritten code in the target language. We don't get any guarantees in that scenario. So this is maybe an okay uh, theorem for, for certain kinds of languages where you sort of always know you have a source language component, but it doesn't scale to things like how C is often used where you have multiple implementations of C compilers, you have binary only libraries or even handwritten assembly code. And you want some guarantees when you link with those things. Okay, so the sort of gold standard for compiler correctness theorems and what a lot of the literature is focused on is on compositional compiler correctness. So here we want some way to specify that we can link with things not necessarily in the source language. So here we have some foreign component f and we want to say that if e is linked with f and then it runs in some source language semantics to v and if uh, M is linked with the same F, right? Not some compiled version, whatever this, this F is, this foreign component, if M is linked with F and M is the compilation of E, then M linked with F should run to, to you and U and V are still related, right? So crucially here, this F can be a component in either the source or target language, or maybe it's an abstract language independent specification of, a, of some module you can link with, right? And I think I saw James hand go up. Uh, yeah. Hi, William. Um, oh. Enjoying this so far. We're in the borders in a car, so sorry if the sound is a bit crappy. The question here is, um, what does it mean to link? And what, what does it mean for F, uh, this foreign thing, to be linkable with source and target components? So I hope you're going to say something about linking, but this is already yeah. mysterious to me. So that's a good question. So very often we just model linking as substitution, right? So E here has some free variables and you link by replacing okay. those free variables with particular instances from F. Um, that's pretty good as long as we're working in Lambda calculus-like languages. Uh, there's a good talk by Jeremy Seek somewhere on why this is insufficient in general, um, but it's a pretty good model for everything I'll be talking about in this talk. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, other questions? Okay. okay, so this is kind of the gold standard. This is what we aim for. We want the separate way of saying you can link with things either in the source or the target, or maybe in some wholly other abstract notion of, uh, of, of specification of behavior. But at the very least, we want to be able to link source and target things together without having to go through the compiler. So uh, for the rest of this talk, I'll assume F is either in the source or the target, and somehow we can just link across languages that way. Okay, so this is what we want to do. And if we could do this, then we would be able to get a compiler correctness theorem that provides guarantees about pretty realistic scenarios, right? We could have multiple implementations of our compiler. We could link with handwritten code. We could link with binary only libraries and we would get a lot of guarantees. And we don't want this foreign component. We don't want lots of restrictions on which language it was uh, written in or what compiler produced it because that would be far too restrictive for most realistic scenarios. So how do we get there? How do we model this kind of linking? So there are a bunch of techniques in the, the literature. I can name probably four papers off the top of my head and their whole purpose for being is trying to come up with this notion of interoperability. How do you specify linking in this way? The one I'm going to focus on in this talk is uh, this paper by Matthews and Findler on operational semantics for multi-language programs. So this paper was focused on just to, it's not focused on compilation, it's just focused on interoperability. So they talk about how do you model a scheme-like language and an ML-like language such that values can flow between the two languages and you get a sensible uh, semantics for interoperability. And it's all based on, inter, on operational semantics. So it's a very operational view of interoperability. A lot of the other techniques uh, are more semantic in nature, right? They'll, they'll model things as sets or um, categories or whatever. But we're taking an operational view in this talk. So first thing I wanna do is give you a sense of how multi-language operational semantics works. So typically we'll start with two languages. We have our source language S and our target language T. Uh, I'm using source and targets because I'm thinking from a compilation perspective, but you can imagine S and T are just arbitrary languages you want to interoperate. 
And both of these already have their own operational semantics. And that's, that's one uh, key ingredient. So they already have their own operational semantics. And here I've shown a couple of rewrite rules. So here we have some sort of strongly typed language where we have a separate Boolean. And in our target language, we have a kind of weakly typed uh, integers are treated as Booleans. So if you have zero, uh, I guess zero here is the equivalent of false. And what we want to do is define a language in which these things can interoperate, right? So we should be able to sort of freely use source and target terms in each other's syntax, right? So we want to define some kind of new syntax where we can write a blue if with a red uh, zero, and that should make sense. And this is a kind of trivial example. In general, right, your languages might have completely different features. Maybe you have closures in one, but you only have function pointers in the other, that kind of thing. Okay, so we're gonna have this mixed syntax. And the way uh, multi-language operational semantics works is what we're going to do is we're going to extend the non-terminals of each language with this boundary term. So in the target language, T, we're gonna add this TS boundary. And this says, this is a target term on the outside. It's a T term on the outside but inside of it, it's a, an S term. We're just gonna embed that. And similarly in the source language, we're gonna have this ST boundary. So it's S on the outside, but it's a T term inside. So, and then instead of just uh, freely using the syntax, you have to explicitly wrap them in this boundary. And now we can embed zero in the blue syntax if we just wrap it in a boundary. And the idea is we define the operational semantics of this multi-language by Combining the two uh, languages we're sort of deriving. So something can take a step in the multi-languages, either it takes a step in the source or it takes a step in the target, or we have to handle these boundary cases. And so then we define a couple of rewrite rules for uh, just values under a boundary, right? So if we see false, but it needs to behave like a T term, then it should step to zero. And if we see zero, but it needs to behave like uh, an S term, it should step to false. So we'll define a couple of these rules for all the boundary, uh, boundaries around all the values in the language. And the multi-language operational semantics paper shows that this is, uh, it suffices to do this for values if you want to define inter interoperability. They, I think they call this the lump embedding. Okay, any questions at this point? I have a question. Uh, does this extend to closures? It does extend to closures. I'll talk about closures in just a minute. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, so uh, my observation is, what is this What is this rewrite system if not a compiler, right? It's compiling source things to target things. It's just doing so as a rewrite rule. So what if we model our entire compiler this way as basically rewrite rules with these little boundary terms indicating we're shifting from one language to another? And this is not a particularly new observation. So these, this is an excerpt and I'll go through this very slowly in a minute. So these are uh, an excerpt of a compiler from uh, Jamie Perconti and Amal Ahmed's verifying an open compiler using multi-language semantics. And in this paper, they show how you can use multi-language semantics to get a, a very rich notion of interoperability, model a compiler and prove it correct. Now, the problem is that in doing, uh, the, the way they use multi-language semantics is they essentially duplicate the compiler in their uh, interoperability semantics. So for every form in the language, they have a compiler rule on the top and then they'll have this interoperability rule on the bottom. And I'm gonna walk through this and we're gonna play uh, a little game and see if we can spot the differences between these rules. Okay, so uh, this, and speaking of closures, so this is, uh, this is part of the excerpt of their closure conversion pass. So the interesting rule here has to do with lambdas. So they're working with a, a system F-like language. So it's got polymorphism um, and they've slightly simplified the syntax. So everything takes uh, an arbitrary number of arguments and all, all functions are polymorphic in some number of variables. The polymorphic variables don't really matter. The details of, of the closure conversion are really what we're interested in. Okay, so we have a value here. It's a well-typed value. And what we're going to do is closure convert it. So in the target language, closures are represented essentially as a pair of the closed value, the closed function, and its environment of free variables. And because it's a well-typed compiler, we're using pack, an existential pair, to hide the type of the environment in the type system. So if two things only differ in their environment, then uh, they have the same type. Okay, so we're trying to convert this lambda to a pair. And the way the compiler works is, well, the first thing we do is generate a new lambda in the target language. And uh, it's gonna have its syntax, it's, uh, uh, sorry, its parameters slightly modified. It's gonna take the new uh, environment argument and then 
its formal variables are recursively translated and its type is adjusted. And then we recursively translate the body, right? This is a standard kind of functional implementation of a compiler. We just recursively translate all the subterms. And since this is closure conversion, we need to look at all the free variables of this Lambda. And then we're going to, in the closure converted code, explicitly project them out of the environment, replacing the free variables with uh, projections from this explicit environment argument, right? And then we actually package up the closure. So its type is just the type of all the free variables. And then we generate a, a big record of all the free variables. So when this closure actually gets uh, created and allocated at runtime, these free variables will take on values will create and allocate this record. And that can always be passed to the function every time it's applied. Okay, so this is standard closure conversion with a few types hanging around. Now the interoperability semantics is for exactly the same case. We have a value of function type and this is at a CF boundary. So it's F on the inside, F is our source language and it's C the closure converted language on the outside. So in order to interoperate at runtime, we need to generate a pack. So the pack is going to be the closed code plus the environment. And as with the compiler, the closed code is going to be some target Lambda and it's gonna have its uh, parameters adjusted slightly. But the first difference is that at runtime, there are no free variables. So we're going to cheat a little bit and we're gonna say, oh, the environment is actually always the unit type at runtime because we're converting a, a closed function to the target language, it will have no free variables. So we just make the environment unit. And similarly, we, uh, its type is unit and also we just allocate the unit value. We have to keep, you know, we, we can't not have the environment because we want our, uh, our calling convention to be consistent. So we have to allocate something here. We just allocate the unit value. Okay. Now in the compiler, we recursively translate the body, but in the interoperability semantics, we're not going to do that. Instead, we're gonna sort of lazily translate the body. We're gonna mark the body with, uh, with this boundary term. So we're going to take the source value V, apply it to the target argument X with a boundary around it. So we can inject the red X into the blue language. And we're gonna take that whole application and wrap it in another boundary term. And the idea is if you ever apply this red Lambda, you'll get a boundary term around a blue application. And then the rewrite system will continue translating that application as needed. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so this is, it, this is kind of the key difference. The compiler eagerly recursively translates all the sub-expressions. This interoperability semantics cheats a little bit, it knows everything's closed, and then it kind of lazily marks the rest of the term to be translated. And this is kind of stupid. It's very annoying if you've ever had to work with it. What we've done is we've written the compiler twice. Once in full generality, uh, eagerly, and then once as this special case compiler, specialized to only closed values, and then uh, added a little bit of laziness. And this is a bit frustrating. If we're working with this, we're trying to prove things about this compiler, we end up having to prove that these two things are equivalent in all the cases that matter. And it's, it's really frustrating. So what if instead of doing this, we didn't specialize this interoperability semantics and we actually derived the compiler from it? And that's the idea in this talk. That's the whole idea. I stared at these rules, I got annoyed, and I thought, can we reduce this duplication? Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about how we do exactly that. We're gonna only define the interoperability semantics, so this latter part of the rewrite rules, and then we're gonna derive the actual compiler. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to define this multi-language operational semantics. So we're gonna define, we have our source, our target, we're gonna define this multi-language operational semantics. And then instead of only defining these, um, these boundary reductions for closed values, we're going to generalize them. We're gonna generalize all these to all open terms. So we're gonna have a boundary uh, rewrite rule for every open term in the language. And then what we're going to do is pick a particular reduction strategy. So if we pick a reduction strategy for these boundary rules, we derive a compiler. And actually depending on exactly which reduction strategy we pick, we get a different model of compilation. So if we fully normalize all these TS boundaries, so these are source terms that need to behave like target terms, we fully normalize all of those, then we just get an ahead of time compiler. But if we run in the multi-language, we get a kind of model of just-in-time compilation. It's a simplified model. It doesn't handle things like uh, speculation and it doesn't have a good notion of when you should actually compile something, but it's a non-deterministic rewrite system and you can freely at any point uh, 
compile to the target language and start running in the target instead of the source. So it's a kind of interesting model of just-in-time compilation. Okay, so that's the idea. And I'm gonna walk through this for a particular translation. And uh, the translation I'm gonna work with is the ANF translation. Okay, so as, as I said at the start of my talk, my thesis is if we start from this interoper uh, interoperability semantics, we can derive a correct compiler. And I wanna use the, oh, I already, already walked through this, yeah. So we're gonna start with the source target reductions, create our multi-language. Uh, we're gonna show the A reductions. So these are reductions that translate, that basically do the ANF translation. If you don't know what the ANF translation is, I'll talk about that. But they're small step reductions from the source to the target. We'll inject them all into a big multi-language reduction that will be kind of our uh, non-deterministic semantics. We can non-deterministically reduce from the source, the target, or compile. We'll derive some compilers and then we'll prove some stuff. So um, it turns out this will, this will have some interesting um, connections between standard rewrite theorems and standard compiler correctness theorems. So, okay. So we'll start with a simple uh, a sort of standard Lambda calculus. This is based on scheme roughly. We've got variables, we've got Lambda application. We've got some effects because effects complicate some compilation passes. So we can set variables to values. Uh, we've got parallel let bindings. We've got begin, which is basically the same as let, except we can use effects so we don't have to bind variables. Okay, uh, we've got a bunch of primitives that don't really matter. In our target language, we're going to stratify the syntax. So values are things like variables, lambda, true, false, and all computation will happen on values. So before you can do an application, syntactically, you have to have a value. Right, so both the operator and the operand have to be values. If you want to set bang a variable, it, you need to set it to a value. So all the operands of all our computations have to already be values in this syntax. And this makes our control flow uh, sort of apparent in the syntax. And that's the goal of AMF. It's very similar to CPS if you work with CPS. Um, it's even more similar to monadic form. Okay, and then at the top level, all of our programs are basically chaining together primitive computations on values. So you can let bind a computation you get uh, to a variable, now that's a value, and you can use that in the next computation. Uh, begin works similarly, but for effectful computations. And then uh, if lets you branch on a value to two different programs, right? Okay, and then we're going to follow the multi-language pattern and we're gonna add some boundary terms. So we're gonna add an SA boundary term. So it's source on the outside, A and F on the inside. And then to all of the productions in the target language, we add an AS boundary. So it's ANF on the outside, but it's actually a source term on the inside. Okay, so note that uh, our target syntax is actually uh, a subset. It's a restriction of the source syntax, even without these boundary terms. Uh, I don't think this is terribly important, but it might, it might come up in, in the next couple slides. Okay, our... Uh, uh, James has a question, dude. Okay, so the question here is, does it make sense for an AS boundary term to be a value rather than a general computation? Does it make AS sense for... AS of E to be part of the value grammar? Yeah, so uh, that is a good question. So it seems like what we're doing here is violating the syntactic restrictions of our language by letting you yep. embed an arbitrary term into the, uh, the sort of values of the target language. So I think what we really want are two separate productions. One, like what is a pure ANF term and one is like a multi-language ANF term. In the pure one, then you only have values, but in this sort of multi-language value, uh, we allow you to embed an arbitrary term in an arbitrary production. I think that's really right. what we want. And I think this might be the root cause of a problem that comes up later. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay. All right, so our reduction systems are completely standard. So we have a, a heap or a store because we have effects and to handle uh, let rec style recursion. Um, we have some values in the source language and we're gonna specify our reduction system using evaluation context. We have a standard left to right call by value evaluation order. So you know, first evaluate your operand, then your operator, uh, uh, sorry, first you evaluate your operator, then your operands. The heap is a map from variables to values, standard. Uh, we've got our beta reduction rule, and then we have our evaluation context rule, which just says force the next computation in the evaluation context. Okay. In the target language, a bunch of the evaluation contexts are eliminated. We only have one non-trivial evaluation context, which is let. 
And that's because most of our evaluation has now been encoded in the syntax of the target language. So the only thing left to do is force all the computations in a let binding until they're all values. And then our evaluation rules are very similar. So you have beta reduction. And the, the only real interesting one is let, which is when all of the, the let bound uh, computations are values, then do this parallel reduction. And then uh, we still have the evaluation rule, or sorry, the, the evaluation context rule, but it's, it's trivial. There's only one. OK, so very similar languages, standard reduction rules. Now, what we're going to do is define all of the boundary reductions. So what happens at the boundaries between languages? And these are called the A reductions. And these are adapted from Flanagan and all's uh, PLDI paper, which defines the ANF translation, but they actually define it as a reduction system. Um, they were interested in some of the other properties of ANF and how it relates to, to CPS. So thankfully, we can adapt these and kind of get the compiler for free. But they weren't using multilingual semantics, so we have to make a few changes. OK, so the first rule, a normal, says um, this is basically the termination condition. This says we're done. So this, this rule wasn't in the original paper because they basically iterate the A reductions until there are none more left. And then you're, by definition, A normal. In our setting, we're using these boundary terms explicitly to, to say which language we're in. So the A reductions are taking a source term to a source term. And this A normal rule says, well, if it happens to already be in a normal form, then mark it explicitly and say, OK, well, we need a source term. So it's source on the outside, but it happens to be A and F on the inside. And this is going to be a termination condition that just blocks A reductions from triggering again. Any, any, anytime you have an SA boundary, um, terms, uh, basically, A reductions won't apply inside of that unless there's another AS boundary. OK, so this says M is completely done being translated. No more A reductions will apply. OK, so the first interesting rule is this A merge let. And what we have on the left here is we have a let expression in evaluation position of some uh, evaluation context. So if you think in CPS, uh, the evaluation context, capital E is the rest of the computation, right? It's some continuation. And we need to provide it a value in the target language. All of our, um, all of our continuations you can think about take values. But we have here is a non-trivial expression that, have, that we need to force some computation to occur. So what we're going to do is uh, our evaluation order says that our let here, the first thing we need to do is, oh, you can't see my cursor, can you? Oh, well. OK, so the first thing we need to do here is force the evaluation of the lowercase e. So we're going to rewrite our computation a little bit. We're going to lift the let to the outside. And we're going to put a boundary, an AS boundary, around that lowercase e. And that says we've done a little bit of translation. So we've reordered this computation. So now the evaluation order is explicitly telling us the next thing to evaluate is this lowercase e. But we haven't finished translating it yet. So we're going to mark it with an AS boundary. But we have translated this let expression. We've sort of translated the head of the expression. So we'll mark that the whole term is uh, an ANF term. So we have an SA boundary on the outside. The let is an ANF. But all of its subterms are still source terms. So we mark them with an AS boundary. So the lowercase e's are the next things to be evaluated. And then we push the evaluation context inside the let. Because once we've forced all the evaluation of all these let bound terms, then we can continue the rest of the computation, this capital E. And that too, we've, we've plugged together the evaluation context with the body of the let, but we haven't translated it, so we mark it with an AS boundary. OK, so this is kind of the most complicated rule we'll look at. Does this make sense to everyone? OK, we've just rearranged the, con uh, rearranged the evaluation, pushed the context in to make our syntax explicitly define our evaluation order. Um, if you're familiar with the monad laws, this is basically associativity. We're reassociating all of the binds, so we never have a bind on the, the right-hand side of a bind. Um, oh, yeah, and I had have, I have some nice staging for this that I forgot to use. So it's now red on the outside, but its subterms are blue. They still haven't been translated. OK, so the A merge begin is doing exactly the same thing, but for begin, because we don't have, um, we don't have binding, so it's doing the same thing. And the sort of uh, terminal rule, this is the rule where we have uh, an ANF computation in evaluation position, but all of our evaluation contexts expect a, a value. So we're going to explicitly bind some primitive computation to a value. That's translating the head. So our, we've now generated an ANF uh, let. Ends are ANF computations, so we don't put a boundary around the N. And then we explicitly put 
uh, the new let bound value X in evaluation position. And now E should be almost in ANF, right? The rest of the rewrite rules will, will finish translating E. But we've kind of simplified how much nesting there is, how many nested expressions there are. Okay, so this is basically lifting any computation, any nested computation, explicitly binding it. And then there are a couple of termination conditions on this. So this rule will never trigger on uh, an evaluation context that is not an N accepting target context. So if if this evaluation context E is already a let, for example, then we don't want it to trigger because it's already valid to have an N bound in let position. And it happens to be the case that our source language allows this context and so does our target language. So we want this as this first side condition as a termination condition, basically. And then the second one is basically don't uh, sort of spuriously bind values to values again. Right? If N is already a V, then don't bind it to X. There was no need to do that. It was already a V. Okay, so these are basically, uh, the, the first one's a termination condition. The second one is kind of an optimization. Okay, so these are A reductions. They're basically performing uh, something like the CPS translation. They're performing the ANF translation, but sort of lazily doing it one, one head term at a time and then marking the rest of the terms to be translated. And the ANF translation is a great test of this strategy because it does all of this rewriting of contexts. Most of the translations in a compiler are pretty local. Um, I've looked at the rest of them in, in a little compiler pass, and they're they're local. They always look at the subterms, so they're easier than this ANF translation. So this makes it a really good test of how the system works. Okay, and there are a bunch of other rules, particularly if and let rack, and but we're not going to look at them. They're not really relevant. Okay, so instead, what I want to do is a demo. I've got all of this implemented in PLT Redux. We're going to walk through a couple of rules. Okay, so here we've got a, a term. We've got a let expression with a nested computation on the right, we've got to begin a little effect. And what we want to do is just see how the ANF translation treats this. So what I've done is I've marked the whole term with an AS boundary. So this is saying it is a source term, but I want it to behave like an ANF term. And so the rewrite system should start trying to translate it. And we're gonna step through a couple of examples. Okay. So if I take a step, it sees that there's a bunch of rules that could apply. Right, so all of these rules can trigger non-deterministically. And I'm gonna pick, uh, let's just pick this one. So in this one, it's parsed the term as, uh, let's see here. Looks like it's parsed the term and it's focused on lifting the set bang out of its evaluation context and binding it explicitly, and then shuffled the evaluation context around. So it's triggered the A lift rule. So it's found a computation, explicitly bound it, uh, and lifted it out of context. I don't think it actually should have done that. So this might've been a bad idea to, to pick this one, but we'll see what happens. Okay, so the next thing that happens, you can see that these two boundaries got canceled out. So we have an AS boundary followed by an SA boundary. So I'll talk about this in a minute, but when that happens, we just cancel out the boundaries because you're shifting from target to source, source to target again, and that doesn't do anything. So we cancel those boundaries. Uh, and we take another step, then there are two rules we can apply. So we can either merge let so we can rearrange, uh, we now have a let and a begin, and we can rearrange those, or we can do merge begin. So we can lift this begin onto the outside and push the let inside. So we'll just pick that one for fun. And then we have some boundaries again. So we have an AS boundary and SA boundary, those get canceled out. And then we have a bunch of different ways we can evaluate. So if we pick this one, it looks all of, all of these are detecting normal forms in the sub expression. So we can pick, uh, I'll focus on this one. So it's noting that this let is now in ANF. So we're just gonna mark it with the boundary and then we'll get another boundary cancellation, I imagine. So here we have a boundary cancellation, we'll pick that one. And then it's finding another normal term. So X by itself is already normal. So we're gonna mark that and do a boundary cancellation. And now we have completed the ANF translation for this term. Um, and it's done something a little bit silly with this set bang. Instead of leaving it in an effect position, it's, it's bound its argument. So there's probably some optimization I can do to the NF, bound, uh, to the NF reductions. Okay, but step by step, we've got a fully translated ANF term now. So you can see all of our computations are now directly on values and all of our uh, control flow is, is basically going through let and begin explicitly. Okay, any questions? Okay, great. I think that's probably enough of that. I'll switch back to my slides. Okay, so in that, uh, in that demo, you probably noticed the, so I, I mentioned these boundary cancellation conditions, and you also noticed it was sort of somehow picking a sub-expression to translate. 
And so what we're gonna do next is define this translation reduction. So basically the idea is take a single step to translate some subterms. So trigger the A and F, uh, trigger the A reductions on sub subterm. So we're gonna define our, um, our multi-language syntax. So it's either a source or a target term. And this reduction is, uh, okay. So this reduction, the first two rules are these boundary cancellations. So if we see an SA followed by an AS boundary, that's just a source term in source context. So remove all those boundaries. And similarly, if we see an AS then an SA boundary, that's just a target term in target context. So remove the boundaries. The interesting rule is how do we pick a term to translate? And so what I've done is I've defined this notion of translation context. So it's a context that says, um, pick some subterm here that hasn't been translated yet. And the way we define this translation context is we say, well, it's going to be an AS boundary with, uh, with a context where almost everything has been translated. So the CM is basically, it's an M accepting context. So an arbitrary M in the target language can be plugged in here. And we can see, for example, uh, let is an M accepting context. You can plug an M into the body, but we're only going to focus on lets where all of the left-hand side has already been translated. So um, all of the term, you're gonna define all of the, the terms in the ANF syntax this way, where you're basically focusing on everything to the left has already been translating, but some term, some subterm hasn't yet. And uh, it needs to be in an AS boundary. So it's a source term, it's not fully an ANF yet, but it needs to behave like an A term, right? So that's this uh, translation context. And we're gonna take the, the rule we add says in an arbitrary context, so pick any subterm such that there is a subterm in translation context and try one of the A reduction rules. And that's what this uh, search that, you just, that we just went through in, in Redex is doing. So pick an arbitrary subterm and of those subterms, pick a subterm that is in translation context and try to translate it. Now there's definitely a bug in this translation context that uh, I did not show you, but I do have a counter example that uh, breaks confluence. So I'm not exactly sure what the bug is, but I think it has to do with what James uh, pointed out, that I'm not actually detecting pure ANF terms correctly because I can have, um, uh, because I, have I can have a source term embedded as a target value and it considers that pure ANF. Okay. So this defines what it means to single step translate some sub expression. Oh, I had some nice staging there too. And now we're going to define the whole multi-language, the sort of just-in-time compiler or just the, the multi-language operational semantics. So our multi-language operational semantics uh, sort of mirrors our source and target. We have a heap and we're gonna take a single step. And the way we do that is we either take a single step in the source language. So if you have a source expression E, you can take a step to some E prime using source semantics. And the heap will also take a step to the to H prime. Or if you have an AS boundary, so this is actually a source term, but needs to behave like a target term, uh, you could instead just step in the source language. So extract E from its uh, multi-language boundary, take a step in the source language and put it back in its boundary. And similarly, if you have a target language M, you can take a step in the target language. So just use the target reduction semantics, take a step, or if you have uh, an M that needs to behave like a source term, well, you don't really have to. You can just take a step in the target language and put it back in its boundary, right? So this is kind of non-determined, this is saying we can non-deterministically, you can take a step in the source or take a step in the target, or uh, you can step across languages. So you have an H, you have an M, right? You have the heap M and some expression M. You can try to step some subterm from the source to the target, right? And leave the H, the heap unchanged. And then you can continue reduction, either uh, stepping some source expression or some target expression. Okay, so this is the whole semantics we've now derived. Um, we can now define, uh, we now have this multi-language semantics where we can step source, step target, or step across languages. Okay. And now anything in here, you can have source and target languages, uh, source and target terms interacting with each other. And if they need to cross language boundaries, then they will. Okay. Now, the one thing to point out here is uh, we do have a heap, right? So our source and target languages rely on, on the heap and uh, that does get threaded around, but it doesn't get translated. So there's an implicit requirement here that our memory models for both languages are the same, but I don't think that's an intrinsic limitation. So we could have rules that translate terms in the heap. Uh, I just haven't done that because 
for ANF, it's not very interesting. So I want to look at some of the lower level languages. Um, but I know that this is a sticking point in some of the compositional correctness literature. But it doesn't seem to be a fundamental limitation of this approach. Okay, uh, I'm going to switch back to show you just a demo of the JIT. Okay, so here we have an implementation of Factorial, everyone's favorite program. You can see I'm starting with an empty heap and we've got an AS boundary. So this is in the source, but I'm saying it can behave like a target if you want it to. And so we'll take a few steps and we can see the first couple are we can uh, JIT compile something. So we can either JIT compile just the body of the Lambda or we can JIT compile the entire term or we can take a step in the interpreter. So in the source language interpreter. Okay, uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and JIT compile, I'll JIT compile the whole thing. So that's what I want to do. Okay, and then we get, as soon as we JIT compile the whole thing, we still have some options. Weirdly, it looks like this, uh, oh, we can do an AS interpreter. So despite having some boundaries here, it detects, oh, there are still some source expressions underneath these boundaries. So we could go ahead and interpret those or we could continue compiling if we wanted to. So uh, let's go ahead and, and run something. So if we run the application, uh, it looks like it eliminated a boundary and then it got stuck. So the only thing left to do is continue compiling. So we can compile a little bit. We can compile a little bit. Uh, let's see, why is it not? Okay, so this is compiling, it looks like the application and then it's compiling, oh, then it's getting rid of boundaries. Oh, oh, and then it's stuck. Okay, so there's, an, uh, there's the counter example to Confluence. It looks like it gets stuck if we take this path. Let me go back to a different path. Uh, okay, so this one, the first thing it did was it JIT compile a little bit. It's gonna JIT compile. Uh, it looks like it's gonna keep compiling the body of factorial. Uh, there it can compile the application and compile, get rid of the boundaries and get rid of the boundaries. And if we keep running, Hopefully we'll get a fully compiled term that it will then evaluate. Take a different path. And it looks like it really doesn't wanna, all of the boundaries are now preventing it from doing any interpretation. So it kind of has to finish compilation before it can run now. Okay, so it finished compilation and then uh, now it, does, it starts running and it's just gonna run factorial. Okay, and I'll stop there and switch back to the slides. Okay. Okay, so that's the JIT compiler and that's our sort of multi-language semantics, but we can derive the ahead of time compiler just by picking a subset of those reductions to apply. So if we wanna derive, or if we wanna define the ahead of time compiler, we wanna uh, translate some source expression E to a target expression M. And the way we do that is we first inject E with a multi-language boundary. So we say it's a source term, needs to behave like a target term. And then we run all of the cross-language reductions to completion. So we we run all of them, we'll get some M such that no more of these cross-language reductions occur. And that should be a fully normalized, fully compiled term, right? We've run all of the cross-language reductions. We shouldn't have any more boundaries. This should be a fully normal uh, target term. And this is how we define compilation. Oh. Okay, now once we do this, the, the main benefit, the, aside from getting an interesting model of compilation of this JIT compiler in particular, uh, we get some really nice meta-theoretic results. So the first one is that uh, compiler correctness just follows from confluence. If we can, if we can uh, prove confluence, which we, there's a bug I need to fix, but if we can prove confluence, so we have some P that takes a step to P1 and P separately non-deterministically takes a step to P2, then both P1 and P2 will eventually reach some common P prime. And intuitively you can see why this is the same as uh, compiler correctness, right? If we start with some source P and it runs in the source language to P1, or you compile it to P2, then both of those better end up at the same P prime. So either P2 runs to P prime or P1 compiles to P prime. And it's pretty easy to prove formally that confluence implies uh, compiler correctness, even without reasoning about the particulars of the translation. And that's just because everything is now defined from this arrow P reduction, including compilation and the semantics of both programming languages. Yeah, so intuitively the multi-language reduction includes both interpreters and the compiler and some non-deterministic choice. So it's pretty easy to derive compiler correctness. And I think even compositional correctness from confluence. 
uh, and there's the formal statement of the corollary. So we start with a source E with an empty heap run to a value, and then we compile E to M, and we try to run M with the empty heap, we'll get to the same value. Okay, so the second interesting uh, property we, we can derive is uh, type preservation. So type preservation is often used for optimization. It's uh, used for safety, so you can get some uh, safety properties from your compiler if you know you preserve types. It basically says if you start with some term E of type A and you compile it, you will get some term M that is well typed. And more generally, you want some relation between the source and target types. And this completely falls out of a standard uh, standard subject reduction uh, lemma about our reduction system. So if E is well typed and it takes a step in the multi-language, then E prime is still well typed at the same type. And you can prove that subject reduction directly implies, oh, not type safety, uh, type preservation. And again, it's because all of these things, the compiler and the reduction system are all defined in terms of this one reduction system. So it's a pretty, again, you, you get this uh, implication without having to reason about the particulars of the ANF translation, which is kind of neat. Okay, and uh, the final thing I will point out, I'm not gonna walk through the proof though, is that you get the easy half of full abstraction trivially from confidence. So full abstraction is often used in secure compilation. And the idea is that basically you want to compile source things uh, so if two indistinguishable source things there are compiled to indistinguishable target things. Okay? So you define contextual equivalence by saying, well, in the source, two things, E1 and E2, are indistinguishable if for every source context, you plug E1 and E2 into that same context and they co-terminate. Right? So no source language attacker can distinguish them. And similarly in the target language, for all target attackers, target contexts, you plug M1 and M2 into them and they co-terminate. Full abstraction says then, if E1 is indistinguishable to E2, if and only if uh, M1 and M2 are indistinguishable, where M1 and M2 are the compilations of E1 and E2. Right? So using multi-language semantics, typically this proof is split up into two lemmas. And the first says you can take two source things, indistinguishable, and embed them in the, in the target, uh, sorry, in the multi-language, like uh, into the multi-language, and they're still indistinguishable. And this is the hard part. It says multi-language attackers, which include target and source attackers, can't learn anything new compared to the source. Right, so this is the hard part of full abstraction. But then there's the second lemma that's relatively easy, but you still have to prove it, which says if two things are indistinguishable in the multi-language, then they're still indistinguishable in the target. Right, and this is kind of this should be trivial because the multi-language includes all target attackers. So obviously the target language attackers don't learn anything new over the source language attackers. Uh, over the multi-language attackers, right? So this easy part um, is actually a completely trivial consequence of confluence for the, the same reasons as correctness. Everything, including contextual equivalence here, is defined in terms of this one multi-language reduction. And uh, the proof I have on the slides, but I'm not going to walk through it, is just a couple of steps. And it's completely trivial. And again, you don't have to reason about the particulars of the translation. So it's nice that this, uh, this easy part becomes trivial if you prove confluence. Um, that lets you focus on the hard part. Okay, so I, I'm gonna leave the rest of this for discussion. Um, the only things I'll say is this technique seems to scale. I've taken a look at the rest of the compiler. I haven't worked out all the details, but I've got closure conversion sort of working. I've got heap allocation and code generation working uh, without some of the, the boundaries. Um, we, we get some nice interesting corollaries, but the main downside I can sort of predict is that confluence is not always easy to prove. Um, and, and at least one technique I know basically turns the rewrite system into a compiler and proves compiler correctness instead because <laughs> they seem to think that was an easier way. So I don't know if this is a great idea, but um, at least it gives us a nice model and some interesting corollaries. So with that, I'll open up for questions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. That was brilliant. Uh, there's a little clap emote. <laughs> And you're getting plenty of. Uh, okay, great. So, does anybody have any questions? I know we've had a couple as we've gone along. Okie doke. Ohad? Can you hear me? Yep. Thanks for, for a nice talk, William. <clears throat> um, so, you talk about a, a compiler, but what about an optimizer compiler? How would that fit into this um, framework? Is it another uh, stage, another multi-language multi, multi, multi -language fragment? Uh, 
Oh. Right, right. So the way I think about compilation is uh, I have a very nano pass view of compilation. So here I've shown one pass. Um, if you wanted to do a bunch of other passes, you would basically write uh, one of these multi-language semantics for each pass. And so I have a Redex model with, with four passes right now, and then maybe you just chain them together. And what you want is basically confluence of the entire diagram all the way through. Um, and if you want optimizations, those should be little passes. And I think they actually should be easier because a lot of optimizations are expressible as source to source rewrites. And they're a little bit easier to express as rewrites than as uh, full translations. So I haven't looked at any in particular, except for a few within ANF. So I mentioned that there was like one little optimization in the side condition of a rewrite rule. Okay, does that, does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, uh, I think Sam's got a question. Yeah, uh, no, thanks for the talk. That's very interesting. Um, so I guess, uh, although we've got this confluent rewrite relation, uh, if you're actually compiling, then you presumably use it deterministically. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. But there are lots and lots of other things you could do. There are all the other paths you can use. Um, do they, are they useful? I mean, apart from improving correctness? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So the, the first use I notice is it kind of models JIT compilation, right? That you can, um, there, there's only, I think, two papers I've seen that try to prove correctness of a JIT compiler, and they really focus on, on speculative, uh, speculative optimizations. But here, just running inside this, um, this multi-language semantics give you a, gives you a nice model of JIT compilation. And you're sort of relying on confluence for correctness. So, that's the most interesting consequence I can see that you get this nice model of JIT compilation and you can start maybe playing with exactly when do you make, like instead of using non-deterministic choice, when should you make these decisions? Um, do, you, is, is, do you think that's sort of complete in some sense in that it captures all possible um, choices that the JIT compiler could make? I mean, yeah. obviously they might do other optimizations and so on that you're not actually capturing, but. Right, right. So I would say, I think it is more general than what of JIT compilers that exist because it's such a fine granularity, right? These multi-language boundaries are on every single subterm. So you can at any point translate any subterm. And I think most JIT compilers don't do that and probably shouldn't do that, um, right? They might translate say a function or a loop at a time. Um, so I think it, it's probably more complete than you need. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what it would mean for it to be complete. Right, but it's not missing out on any behaviors that a JIT compiler might do. Uh, yeah, yeah. Other than the fact that you know, I haven't studied, I haven't added like speculative optimization to yeah, this or obviously. tracing right. that kind of thing. But um, in the sense that it's it's allowing you to cross boundaries at an arbitrary granularity, I think it's not missing that kind of expressiveness. Yeah, no, that's kind of cool. Um, it it feels like there must be many other collect, uh, connections with uh, multi-stage systems. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the other things that I see in it, but I, I haven't made formal is it looks a lot like a macro system in a way, or yeah, like a multi-stage uh, programming system. Uh, macro systems also do this very, uh, this kind of rewriting and then lazy evaluation, right? They rewrite the top level macro and then um, it open recurs to the top of the loop and then continues if there are any, any new macros as sub expressions. Um, but I haven't looked at trying to model a macro system using the same technique. And I wonder, it must be the case that in macro systems or other metaprogramming systems, people have combined those with ANF translations, in which case um, answering your the, James's question might be just a case of looking at what someone else has done and seeing, oh, yeah. this thing shouldn't be a value. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know of any macro systems that do any, do I know that? Uh, I know the Shea scheme does some translations pretty early in the, but I don't know if it does them, I don't think it can do them before macro expansion. I do know some type checkers do ANF translation before type checking because it simplifies some decisions. Uh, I think liquid Haskell does this, but I don't know how related that is. Okay, anyway, thanks. Yep.
Okay, great. Uh, I think we've got one more question. Uh, so that's uh, Xu Hong Yu. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you for thank you for the very interesting talk and, and the idea. Um, I'm a little bit curious because in the ANF translation, the boundary uh, propagation seems to follow the recursive structure like the algorithm. Um, and normally, when, when you only think of boundary crossing in terms of like interaction between languages, there is something natural like flipping between the source and target and target and source boundary when you have functioning applications. Um, is, is there something similar or, or is there some boundary um, whose whose inside and outside are reversed comparing to the usual like multi-language interaction? Yeah, so one of the things I didn't discuss um, very much in the, in the original multi-language um, uh, operational semantics, yeah, there were particularly around higher order values, so things like functions, you get the reverse direction of this boundary. So ANF doesn't seem to need that. I'd have to look at how join points get introduced for the if rule to, I, I don't remember off the top of my head if I need one. I don't think I do though. Um, I know that for closure conversion, when we walked through that, that rule, you do need both directions because you have this target language uh, variable that you need to inject back into the source. And I haven't looked at adding multi-language, I haven't looked at adapting um, that particular rule in this setting. So right, right now I have modeled closure conversion as a rewrite system, but without multi-language boundaries. And it relies on uh, basically the syntax is being indis uh, completely separate, so you don't have lambda in, in both languages. You have like lambda and C lambda. So I want to try oh, to add okay. language boundaries and, and see if I do need that reverse direction for closure conversion. That's where I would expect it to come up. 